turn to John chapter 4. We're going to continue in our series that we started a couple weeks ago, and that is Why Worship? We're taking a look at uh, this, this practice of worship that we have on Sunday mornings. We call Sunday morning our worship service. Many years ago, we called it that. It was I had pulled out some flyers and used that as an example when I went through this series back then, and, um, but there was nothing particularly distinctive about our Sunday morning service that would indicate that it would be called something different from any other service. And that's why we did this study. Why is it that we, we call it a worship service and what are we doing that we call worship? And so the purpose of this series is to really identify what biblical worship is, what it looks like, and how we can practice it today. So the first message we talked about, do we value worship? How, how important is worship to us? And the takeaway that I really want you to remember from that message is that God values worship. So whatever it is, however it is that we perceive it, God certainly values genuine biblical worship and he's seeking it. This is something that he wants that we can give him that would be pleasing to him. And so it ought to be important. If it's important to God, it ought to be important to us. Uh, last week, we talked about this. this. We actually asked the question, what is worship? And so we spent that week sort of defining the concept of worship. And we'll look at the, the definition that I gave you last week again today. But uh, just suffice it to say that um, we, we defined worship by, number one, by looking at the actual biblical words that are translated worship in your Bible. And we looked at a Greek word, we looked at an, uh, a Hebrew word, and, and in both cases, it means to humble yourself, to abase yourself, to lower yourself, to lay prostrate, to bow. And it, the Greek word even goes so far as to liken it to the cringing, sort of self-abasing that a dog will do in the presence of his master. Licking of the hand is sort of the picture that is drawn by that Greek word. Uh, which we simply translate worship. And then we, not only did we define the concept of worship by looking at the words used in the Bible, but then we looked at examples of worship actually being practiced, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. And in every case where you find someone worshiping where it is clear, you find a person bowing or lying prostrate or, or, or throwing themselves at the feet of the one who's receiving the worship. And then finally, we, we spent just a little bit of time talking about the distinction between worship and other spiritual disciplines. In the message this morning, we're actually going to take that last point, uh, saying that, you know, how is worship a distinct spiritual discipline? We're going to take that last point and we're going to elaborate it on. And the, the whole message this morning is going to be about that. And the title of the message is this. So last week it is, What is Worship? This week the title is, What is Not? worship. I think sometimes it can help to understand a concept if you can contrast that concept with other distinct concepts. So in helping us to define what is worship, we're going to ask the question this morning, what is not worship? Our, our text for this series is in John chapter 4. Did you already turn your Bibles there? Say amen if you did. All right. John chapter 4, and we're just going to read verse 23. This is the, uh, the really important um, interaction that Jesus had with the woman at the well. So many really deep and powerful truths are contained in this, this text. But John chapter 4, verse 23, where Jesus says this, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Again, the title of the message this morning, What is Not Worship? Father, we thank You for this this time, we thank you for this church. We thank you, most of all, for your son, Jesus Christ. Now, without him and without the sacrifice that he made on the cross of Calvary, we would not have access to your throne room. We would not be able to come to you in prayer. And certainly, our worship would not be acceptable, no matter what, what we did, what, how we defined it, where we did it. None of that would matter because our sin would still separate us between us and our God, between us and you. And so... We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for his blood and we're thankful for the cross of Calvary. And Lord, I pray this morning as we look at your word and we try to define this concept, try to define this word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom, give us discernment, help us to understand the scriptures. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us as, as no earthly voice can. 
And I pray that you'll be glorified in the preaching. Lord, help me to preach with power. Help me to not be in the flesh at all, but only say the things you would have me to say. And I pray that everybody that's gathered either online or in person, that they would have ears to hear. And Lord, I pray uh, that you would receive all the honor from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, John 4, 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. If there's such a thing as true worship, that means there's such a thing as false worship. If there's such a thing as true worship, that means there's such a thing as fake worship. If there's such a thing as true worship, I would say there's such a thing as disingenuous worship. And it would, I feel it would be pretty important for us as followers of Jesus, if we wanted to worship God in spirit and truth, we need to understand the difference. We need to understand the difference between true worship and pick whatever, uh, whatever adjective you want to use there for the opposite. Now, I'm going to start again by giving you the simple definition I gave you last week. If you didn't get it last week and you want to get it, try to copy this down. I'm going to give it to you two times. Ready? Worship is the voluntary humbling of oneself physically and spiritually in order to exalt another. Let me say that one more time. Worship is the voluntary humbling of oneself physically and spiritually in order to exalt another. Now... We've begun to sort of flesh out what we mean by humbling oneself. And we did that last week by just giving simple definitions, defining the words, giving examples of how that word is used in context in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. This week, we're going to spend a little more time in the contrast between this spiritual discipline and other spiritual disciplines. And here's the idea you need to get a hold of this week. You need to understand that worship is distinct. Worship is is distinct from other spiritual disciplines. Now, I'll give the same caveat I gave last week. This is not to say that there is no worship in song. This is not to say that there's no worship in prayer. This is not to say that there's no worship in giving. As a matter of fact, as far as things we do in our church service, before we added the element of bowing to our church service, the time of giving was probably the closest thing to biblical worship that we did distinct biblical worship because when you give you're essentially humbling yourself and you're saying by giving this 10 percent, if you tithe by giving this 10 percent, i'm acknowledging that the other 90 percent also belongs to god because that was part of the intent of a tithe it was acknowledging that everything you have belongs to him and by giving this this specific percentage that he asks for uh we're acknowledging that and so you're kind of you're humbling yourself this this is not mine this is his uh, I didn't purely earn this. We, we know that if you get up and go to work, you, you earned a paycheck. The workman's worthy of his hire. That's a biblical concept. But we also should acknowledge that the fact that I have the health to get up and go to work is grace. Right? So we need to acknowledge that wherever we're at. And um, Well, I'll leave that there. I'm about to get off on a big rabbit trail there. I'm going to leave it there. So, you need to understand that worship is distinct from other biblical disciplines. What other biblical disciplines? So, we're going to retouch the biblical disciplines that we talked about in the last point of the message last week. We're going to re-hit that with some additional scriptures, but then we're going to add an extra element that we didn't talk about last week. I mentioned it in passing, but we didn't really talk about it. We're going to spend a whole, a whole portion of our time this morning talking about it. So, what is not worship? Number one, worship is distinct from prayer. Worship is distinct from prayer. Now, again, had that caveat. There is an element of worship in prayer. How so? Well, um, we are taught, I was, I've been taught since I was a little bit of a kid, that you're supposed to be humble when you pray. Right? So we have the, the parable of the, uh, the, 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 the priest who was in the temple and the sinner, the publican in the, in the temple. And one was, oh God, you're so lucky to have me. I'm so great. I'm so wonderful. I had his, head, his eyes lifted up to heaven and his arms outstretched. Jesus talked about the, the, the Pharisees loving to pray in the, in the chief places, in the chief place of concourse, in the, in the street corners, and they had these ritualistic prayers that they would repeat, and they would quote all kinds of scripture and just make a big show of themselves. And, and of course, then we have the contrast in the parable of the public and the sinner just beating his breast and his, his eyes downcast, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He, we have the instruction from Jesus to go into a secret place, a quiet place. So we've, we're taught 
from an early age that when we pray, we ought to be humble, that we shouldn't make a show of ourselves. And so there's an element of lowering yourself when you pray, right? We teach our, our children to fold their hands and, and, and bow their heads. And, and part of that is begging, asking. That, that's, if you didn't realize, that's what you're doing. That's why you're having your kids do that. It's a, it's a posture of, of uh, essentially beseeching someone Please, please, you know, that's, that's why you're doing that. Also, it's helpful to keep kid, help teach kids keep their hands still and not be looking around while they're praying. There's, there's multiple reasons why, why we do those things. We teach, we teach to, to, to kneel when we pray, to bow your head. So there's sort of a posture. There's a bit of a posture of worship that we teach when it comes to prayer. But, but prayer, by its very nature, is primarily about what? We defined it last week. Prayer is asking. The word to pray means... To ask, or to request, or to beg. That's what the word prayer means. We gave several examples. I'll reiterate some of those examples here. 1 Chronicles 4.10, a very famous prayer. There was a book written about it some years ago, The Prayer of Jabez. Not very long portions of the passage. I'm not really sure how he wrote a whole book about this. But 1 Chronicles 4.10, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast." And that, mine, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. Right? So that, that's it. That's the whole prayer of Jabez. And it says, and God granted him that which he requested, asked. Right? So what was his prayer? His prayer was a request. His prayer was an ask. Um... James chapter 5, starting in verse 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly, or asked earnestly, requested earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. He made a request, God granted the request. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus himself told us in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, he said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. What's he saying? Pray. Pray. Why don't, you get, why don't you have the things that you desire? Because you didn't ask. How many times do we, 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 we desire things and we seek after things and we, and we work for things and we fight for things and we forget to ask our Heavenly Father? When every good gift and every perfect gift that we have, in our, every good thing we have in our life came from Him. And if you want this good thing, if, if it's a good thing, you ought to ask for Maybe sometimes we're not asking because we know it's not good. We know, we, we know it's something we shouldn't have. We already know what the answer is. You know, I think sometimes my kids won't ask me for things because they know what the answer is already. And, and maybe that's a good thing. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. And then James 4, 2, very important. We already kind of iterated this point. James 4, 2, you lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not. We, we'll do anything to get the things that we want. But there's one thing we left out. Why don't you have it? Because he asked not. He didn't ask God. So, worship is distinct from prayer because prayer is asking, number one. Number two, worship is distinct from praise. Worship is distinct from praise. I think praise and worship today are often um, either confused or made synonymous with one another. You know, we we talk about praise and worship bands. We talk about a time of praise and worship. And we really are generally in those times only doing one thing. We're praising. We're praising. I've, I've made a graphic. I didn't get it on the computer, so you guys didn't get to put it up there. I've only got a couple more messages. So by the time we start using the graphic, the series is going to be over and they're going to be done with it. I made a graphic. Oh, I need a screen up here so we can show it. Um, it says worship at the top, and it's got a question mark. And then below that, there's two pictures. In one picture, you've got a scene that looks very much like a concert of some sort. And in that scene, there's a lighted, it looks like there's even like fog going on or something. Because you can see the lights, beams all through, the, through the moisture in the air, the fog in the air. And there's a person or persons up on stage with microphones, instruments, things like that. And then down, and, and you're looking at this from the audience, from the crowd. And down in the crowd, what you see is it's all shadowed. You know, it's, it's, it's very colorful, but it's really just all shadows. You see the figures of people, their heads up, their hands up in the air, fists up in the air, 
having a great time. Now, there's probably some praise going on there. I'll just give them the benefit of the doubt. There's some pra- Perhaps there's some praise to God going on there. Okay? But is there worship going on? I say, I say that worship is distinct from praise. Biblically speaking, worship is distinct from praise. If prayer is asking, what is praise? Praise is thanking. Praise is thanksgiving. It's thanksgiving. Now listen. One of the best things you can do is give thanks to God. One of the best things you can do. One of the best spiritual disciplines. One of the best elements for you to include in your prayer life is praise. I, I, I was taught that you ought to spend some time in prayer. One of the first things you do in prayer is thank God for what he's already done. So, um, praise is thanksgiving. Uh, found this quote, praise like worship attributes worth to God. So there are some similarities. However, praise may be more expressive of what God has done, his blessings, rather than who he is. Remember I said that when we worship God, worship is because of God's nature. Worship is because of God's character. Worship is because of who he is, not primarily what he's done. Because if we're only praising him, if we're only, quote, worshiping him because of what he's done, we're really just thanking him for his goodness to us. When, whether he's done anything recently or not, he's still worthy of your worship. He's worthy. Uh, he, he, he could have done nothing for us and he'd still be worthy of our worship. But of course, that's not the case. He's done a lot for us. Judges 5, 2 says, Praise you the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. He says, why are we praising him? Because he, he avenged us. Because he was good to us. He's a blessing to us. Um, so, and, and there's a lot of overlap. Again, song, prayer, praise. There's overlap, especially in prayer and praise. In First Chronicles, we have an example of prayer progressing to praise. In First Chronicles 16.35, it says, And say ye, save us, O God of our salvation. So they're asking for salvation. And gather us together and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. So he's asking for something. He says, by the way, the reason we're asking for this is because we know you can and we want to praise you for doing it. So... Again, the primary component in praise, then, is thankfulness. Turn with me to Psalm 100. Let's let's look at this psalm of praise as it names itself. Psalm 100, starting in verse 1. A psalm of praise says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve you the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. By the way, when we sing, it's mostly praise. It's mostly praise. Now, we, we include a little element of music in our time of worship. Um, but we try to pick songs. Try. And it, 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 it can be difficult if you don't want to sing the same songs every single week. But we try to pick songs that are primarily focusing on who God is. On his character. On his attributes. Not primarily focusing on what he's done. Right? So like the song today, Face to Face. Just kind of thinking about Jesus and that moment when we're going to be before him and just how great he is and how wonderful he is and how worthy he is that moment. And I guarantee you there will be worship in that moment in the most literal physical sense possible. So he says, serve you, Lord, glad is come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us. So we're praising him for creation right there. Right. Um, so he's, talk, he's calling everybody to a moment of praise, a time of praise, a time of singing. And, and why do we praise him? Because he made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. That means he protects us. He provides for us. We're his. Um, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for or because the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. So it's a, man, he's done all this wonderful things for us. He's such a good God. He's so, he's so generous to us. Another quote for you. The greatest saint in the world is not he who prays more or fasts most. Most is not he who gives alms or is most imminent for temperance, chastity, or justice. 
It is he who is most thankful to God and who has a heart always ready to praise him. So the point of this message is not to rank the spiritual disciplines and make one more important than the other. It's just to make them distinct from one another so that we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Right, we, right, we pray. We go to God in prayer to ask. We praise. We go to God in, during our prayer we can praise. During our time of song we praise Him. We're thanking Him. We're just reflecting on how good He is and how generous He is and all these wonderful things He's done for us. We should be specific in our praise. Right? And, and whether we're praising Him in song or whether we're praising Him uh, in, in, in prayer, we should be specific in our prayers, thanking God for the specific things He's done for us even this week. You know, it's, it's always wonderful not only to have requests, but to also be mindful and thoughtful about the, the prayers he's already answered. You know, um, you know it, we, could, we, could become, we could become sort of, what, what would be the right word, spoiled, maybe? Um, certainly unthankful is the word, but that's a little obvious. We, we could become sort of spoiled and, un, and unthankful, sort of like entitled. That's the word I'm really looking for. We could become almost entitled if we don't spend some time being thankful to him, right? We can just get to the point where we just expect it. You know, God, God owes this to me. Ooh, be careful. He doesn't owe us anything. It's all grace. It's all mercy. So worship is distinct from prayer. Worship is distinct from praise. And one last thing I want to point out. Now, I just want to tell you that um, to, to prepare for this message, I did a very uh, thorough study of this concept looked up every verse i could find on this and studied each one in context as best i could and i want to tell you that it's pretty conclusive okay and this one might be a little controversial i don't think it's too controversial for uh, us it, generally i say us um, most of us certainly the ones who were raised independent fundamental baptist we're not going to have any problem with this because we don't ever do it but some of you didn't come from independent fundamental baptist and this might be more controversial for this for you, and is this last statement: Worship is distinct from raising hands. Can I get an amen? Now I thought about, <laughs> I thought about looking up that um, that bit, that comedy bit. There's a there's a guy, a Christian-ish uh, comedy guy who has a little bit about, you know, people's raising hands, different ways that they do it. I wasn't raised in a tradition. I mean, so just so you know, some of you have never been south. But the further south you go, the more flamboyant independent fundamental Baptist churches get. We're kind of on the edge. So you can find flamboyant independent fundamental Baptist churches right around here. As, when I say flamboyant, I mean more flamboyant than us. There's some audible stuff that comes from the congregation here at Fulton Bible Baptist Church, but not a lot. You guys are fairly quiet. And I've just sort of resolved myself to that. I don't get worked up about it. I don't try to get my worth or the value of my sermon or the greatness of my sermon from whether you guys respond verbally or not. I've just decided not to do that. Uh, when I was in Bible college, I got used to people just being very verbal. Very verbal. verbal. I mean, almost to the point where it's sort of like distracting from the message. You've got to kind of learn to kind of phase it out, sort of filter it out because it gets so distracting. Um, <laughs> So, but, but, so down there also, you know, you got people just, woo, doing this. They, it's like they feel more comfortable about raising their hand if they got a Bible in their hand. <laughs> it's not, it's not charismatic if I got a Bible in my hand, especially if it's a King James Bible. <laughs> if you're uncomfortable raising your hand and put a Bible in it, it makes it okay. I've seen people throw their Bible up in the air. I've seen people wave hankies, getting excited, jump up in the chair. I used to do this a lot when we had pews. I don't do it so much in a pul there's upholstery, you know what I mean? I'm going to take care of God's stuff. Um, but when we had hard wooden pews, I didn't care. I'd jump all over them. I was a little bit more energetic too. I was younger. I was younger back then. Um, raising hands. There's a few who do it in our midst. Perfectly biblical, but what is the distinction then? If there is a distinction, I'm claiming there is. What is the distinction between worship and raising hands? So I guess you got to ask your, your, the question, biblically speaking, what is raising hands for? 
When was it done in the Bible? Well, let's look. How about that? Let's look. So first of all, I'll just tell you straight out, raising hands is for prayer and praise. But primarily, which one would, which one would you guess the primary purpose of raising hands was? Prayer or praise? Ooh, kind of split. Raise your hand if you think it's primarily for prayer. I'm not going to vote. You think, okay, what about praise? Almost everybody says praise. Wrong! It's prayer. It's prayer. <laughs> so, now, now, sometimes in the prayer, they were praising. <laughs> okay? So, but, but, but we'll, you'll see in just a second. So, number one. It is exemplified as a part of prayer, meaning you see many examples of people raising their hands when they pray. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. Say, prove it. All right, let's prove it. Let's look at our Bibles. Let's be like the Bereans. All right. 1 Kings chapter 8. And so this is when they're dedicating Solomon's temple. Okay. 1 Kings 8, starting in verse 22. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel. Listen to this. What's he doing? What, how does it describe his posture? Standing. He's standing. Okay, Not bowing. Standing. So Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. That means up. Right? Not down. Up. Spread forth his hands. Both hands. So he was a double hander, not, not one hand. His hands toward heaven and said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. So what's he doing here? He's praying to God. He's also praising. He's got his hands up. He's got his hands up. He goes on in verse 54. It says in 1 Kings 8, 54, and it was so that when Solomon, what is he doing there? Is he praying? Is he praising? Well, let's let the Bible define it for us. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying, all his prayer and supplication of the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread out. So at first he said he was standing. At some point, apparently, he got down on his knees. So there's an element of worship there. But mostly he was praying. Primarily he was praying. There was praise in his prayer. Certainly there was praise in his prayer. But he also made requests, supplications. Supplication means begging God, asking God, beseeching God. Um, hands raised in prayer. Turn with me to Ezra 9.5. Again, we're looking at examples of hands being raised as a part of prayer. Ezra 9.5. It says, Ezra 9.5. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness. And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And he begins to pray. So we see, we see now several examples now of men raising their hands as a part of prayer. Now, not only that, we see it exemplified as a part of prayer. We also see it described as a part of prayer. So, so we see narrative accounts of people praying and raising their hands when they pray. Now we're going to see descriptions or instructions to people to pray and telling them when you pray, raise your hands. Okay? So first example, Isaiah 115, or d descriptions primarily, Isaiah 115. Now, unfortunately, this is not a positive description, but it is a description, a physical description of what they were doing when they, when they prayed. So he wasn't saying that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. The thing that was wrong was their hearts. Okay, so while this is a negative example, the, the, the negative aspect of it is not their posture. It's not their action. It's, their, it's what's in their heart, and that's why God rejects them. But Isaiah one fifteen says, And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers. Why are they lifting up their hands? To pray. What's he saying? I'm not going to hear you. I'm not going to listen to you, even though you make many prayers, even though you, you even go so far as to raise your hands when you pray. I'm still not going to hear you. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. So you're hypocrites, right? So, you know, again, it, you know, it's not like um, speaking of worship. What are we saying worship is? Humbling yourself, specifically bowing. 
lowering yourself physically, taking a specific posture to communicate a message of what's in your heart. Is it possible to have the right posture and your heart be in the wrong place? And is God going to accept that worship? Even though it's, it's perfect posture, it's a perfect, uh, it's a perfect form, everything's perfect. Is he going to accept that if he knows your heart's in the wrong place? No. Right? So, so ultimately, what God wants first is your heart. That's what he wants first. But I think that if our heart's right, we're also going to want to be as biblical as we can be. And so, again, the problem here was not the raising hands. It was the blood on their hands, the hypocrisy, the violence, the, the sin, the wickedness. Um, Psalm 28. This is the psalmist talking about his own prayer, describing his own prayer habits. He says, Psalm 28, verse 2. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Pray. When I pray, I lift my hands. So we see many, many examples of kings, of prophets, of God's people at large. When they prayed, they would raise their hands. So we see that it, the practice of raising hands in prayer specifically, but sometimes it's a part of the praise that's included in prayer. It's exemplified as a part of prayer. It's described as a part of prayer. But then lastly, and maybe most importantly, this is going to be the hard one for all you guys raised, born and raised as independent fundamental Baptists who feel uncomfortable with those public shows of exuberance. It's commanded. That's right. It's commanded that we raise our hands when we pray. 1 Timothy 2.8. Not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2.8. There are people who like to ignore Paul's writings. They don't, they don't like what Paul has to say. They want to exclude Paul's writings from the scriptures because it's just more convenient for them to do so theologically, socially, or um, culturally. But we're not of that ilk, are we? Nope. It's all God's word. It's scripture. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.8. I will therefore... This is what I want. I will therefore. By the way, I, I've, I've heard people make these kinds of arguments. There's a couple places where Paul says things like this. I will therefore. Or he'll say, um, not the Lord, but I speak. I speak. Um, so just so you're clear. Sometimes when Paul says something like that, he's saying, so this doctrine that I'm sharing with you is new. Meaning, I'm not getting this from the Old Testament. This is new revelation. Does the fact that it's new revelation make it any less authoritative than Old Testament revelation that's just being carried forward into the New Testament? No, it does not. And here's the fact of the matter. It's included in the canon of Scripture. Right. Holy Spirit of God moved him to say these words, to speak these words, to write these words. So it's just as much Scripture and just as authoritative as any other command. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere. And, and this is the... I, I think this is just the, the general men, mankind, that men pray everywhere. So it's not saying, men, you're commanded to pray, raise your hands. Ladies, you keep your hands down. I don't think that's the point in this particular passage anywhere. Anyway, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. When's the last time? <laughs> is, this, is this good enough? It's good enough. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we don't do way up in the air. Keep it down low. Uh, when's the last time I, I, I remember here? I don't remember where this was at. I think it was at, at a, some kind of conference. Maybe it was a, I don't know if it was a marriage conference or a teen conference, something. So I was at some event and listening to an evangelist preach. He's actually, he's not an evangelist. He's a pastor who, who does preach out. I remember what, I don't even remember what pastor it was. But anyway, he said he challenged his men one time. He says, when's the last time you raised your hands when you're praying at the restaurant? That could be a little uncomfortable. You know, we try to be all subtle when we pray at the restaurant. Let's all bow our heads. And shh, no one can to hear us. We pray real quietly and then we get back and then we go back to eat. Like, we're normal. We're normal. We're not weirdos. You know, maybe we ought to be a little weird. Yeah. Just saying. Now, I say that. I haven't done it. You guys go first. You go first. <laughs> 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 
definitely the kind of thing I would have done when I was in high school, for sure. There's more. There's not just one verse. There's more. Look at Lamentations with me. Lamentations 2. I think sometimes it's almost as though, you certainly get this sense here in Lamentations, that this is almost an act or an aspect of prayer when, when you're really cry, pouring out your heart, when you're really desperate for the Lord to, to work, you know. Um, Lamentations 2.19, Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Pretty desperate situation going on here at this point. And, you know, I think, you know, part of it is just to communicate, communicate to God how serious we are, how, how fervent we are. It's, you know, um, I've, seen, I've seen people do the hand lifting uh, to idols. You see that. Uh, musicians in particular at concerts, they'll raise their hands. And I, I remember, who was it? I think it was, I remember there was like a documentary going around social media. It's sort of, a, it's just a little short, you know, social media type documentary. But it was essentially a Christian warning parents about the artist named Beyonce. At concerts, she was actually calling for her fans to worship her or, or to praise her or to put their hands toward her. And so people were just raising their hands and they were, they were pushing their hands toward her, giving her praise, giving her adulation, giving her accolades. And then she began to behave very strangely as a result of that. So there was the implication that there was some spiritual, satanic kind of stuff going on um, on, on the stage. I don't, I don't remember the, the author of, of that thing. So, but, but that is a common practice for people to do that. And, um, but, so, so lifting your hands is a biblical practice. We see it exemplified, we see it described, and I would go so far as even to say commanded. That at least at, at times, it would be extremely appropriate and maybe even needful for this to be a part of your prayer life. But just to be clear, did we see any examples of people raising their hands to worship? Was there worship, specifically worship going on in any of those examples? And I can, between, between God and me and you, I'm not hiding any passages from you. I didn't leave them out on purpose because they weren't convenient for my, my rhetoric. Okay? I have a document. I will print it out and give it to you. I printed off every single verse that mentions raising hands in any context. And it's not there. Never does anyone raise their hands while worshiping. Worship is distinct from prayer. Worship is distinct from praise, and worship is distinct from raising hands. Um, I gave you that definition at the beginning. Worship is the voluntary humbling of one person, physically and spiritually, in order to exalt another. Now, there's a specific manner, biblically speaking, in which we're supposed to humble ourselves in an act of worship, physically. And what is that? Worship is is the distinct expression of awe and adoration by the act of bowing. Worship is the distinct expression of awe and adoration. What, what is awe? When we, we use that word all the time in a compound. Awesome. Yeah. When we say, that is awesome! What are we saying? That's, that makes me feel awe when I see it, right? If we're in the presence of God, we ought to feel awestruck that he would come into our presence, that, that he would care to hear from us, that he wants my offering, that he wants to hear me sing, that he wants my service, any of that, awesome. Adoration, love him, adore him, because he first loved me. Not, not because I'm so spiritual or I'm so wonderful, because he's 
He's wonderful. The best way to express those truths is to worship him by humbling yourself physically, by bowing. And it's distinct from praying, from praising, and raising your hands. So I'll, I'll close the message this morning by asking you a question. Do you understand what worship is? And do you understand what worship is not? You must, if you want to be a worshiper, a true worshiper, who worships, a, worships, a, worships him in spirit and in truth.